Okay, I think we're live, and uh, bear with me, guys, because this is this is new to me. Um, I'm streaming from another country with a very different setup than I normally use, so please let me know if you can see me and if you can hear me. Um, it's not showing as having started yet. That's weird. Oh, there we go. I'm using the chat. Um, awesome. Yeah, because my phone is my camera and my sound. And I'm using... I'm streaming from my laptop. I'm using my iPad for the chat so I can see you guys on the chat. Normally, I have two screens. I have a microphone and I have a webcam. So I, I set all of this up a little while ago. So I wasn't sure how it was going to work. So... Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, how you doing? It's good to see you guys. Um, the weather's been interesting, Odds. Uh, the day I flew in, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to kind of talk you guys through my first three days and what I've experienced so far. Uh, and it is flipping cool, Sarah. I'm still kind of in disbelief a little bit that I'm here. Um, I'm going to show you guys some pictures from my first three days, talk to you a little bit about my experience so far. Uh, I am so unbelievably excited to share all of this with you. How is the French food? Well, that's a great question, because question, I haven't had a bunch of, bunch of French food yet. There's not a lot of places to get food near my hotel here in Verdun, so I've been eating from a couple of American food places, which is about all that deliver to my hotel, and I can't go anywhere. Um, because I haven't been able to find a pharmacy that can actually issue the vaccine pass that I need to go into a restaurant. So I've been having food delivered to my hotel and there's like three places that will deliver and they're all American places. So, um, but, uh, well, I, I did have some amazing croissants with breakfast yesterday morning in REMS. So that was really good. Um, I'm not going to be able to get to Belgium on this trip. Oh, you can see all kinds of shell holes. I'm going to show them to you. Um, if, if there's one thing that I can tell you from my, my first experience in Europe is that I'm already thinking about coming back. So uh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, especially if these videos do really well and they can boost the channel a little bit. That'll help make it possible for me to do it again. So, um, all right. So let me just talk you through my experience. Um, I got about two hours of sleep on the flight here, um, which was about what I expected. So that wasn't really a huge deal. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to go to Germany. Uh, I got in to the airport at about 830. Um, took me about an hour to get through the airport, Get uh, went to an ATM to get some euros just in case I needed it. Um, and then I uh, got my rental car and it was all pretty easy for, for all of that. So I actually got to Bellow Wood right at about the time I expected to. And that was when the first mishap happened. And Pea Shooter, thank you, appreciate that. Um, I, I showed you guys in my video, my preview video, and let me adjust this um, camera a little bit. I showed you in my preview video that I got that brand new wireless mic that was gonna allow me to get away from the camera a little more and kind of, do some different things. I was setting up for my very first shot at Bellow Wood uh, in the um, Marne Cemetery there. And as I was setting it up, I was putting, I'd put the adapter, the receiver adapter on my phone and I was hooking up my phone to the, um, to the tripod and I dropped my phone, which isn't a big deal. I've got a really nice case on it to protect it, but it snapped the receiver. And so I can't use my wireless mic at all. The brand new one that I just bought, uh, I never even got to use it. So thankfully I did bring my wired backup and now my wired backup, the clip is broken. So I've got it like attached to the zipper on my jacket. So um, I am, I'm not with family, I am alone, uh, but I've been talking to my wife and kids a bit throughout the day, each day to share my, share my experiences with them. So all is well uh, at the moment. Deborah, hey cousin, how is it going? That's my cousin Deborah, guys. Um, her grandpa and my great grandpa were brothers. 
Uh, the storm wasn't real bad in France today, so I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to day three. So I get to Bellow Wood, and, and first of all, there was a real emotional experience for me because I guess I pushed, I did that the wrong way, huh? Um, I pull in to the Einmarn Cemetery. It's the very first place I went, and uh, I got really emotional because, you know, I've been planning this trip for months, and I've never been to Europe before, and these are things that I've seen in videos and on photos and, and to be there for the first time kind of got overwhelming for me and you'll see that in the video uh when i when i do the video from that site um but uh it, it was it was quite a first experience and so i so i did that video um it was really really foggy my first day i'm talking like 150 feet up is about where the ceiling was before you got into the clouds it was really really low like when we came into land in paris i didn't even see the ground until about 20 seconds before we landed that's how low it was um plans are great until you meet the enemy that is exactly right um but Geralt, welcome uh, i'm glad you're here yes i am traveling alone uh, and this is my first time in europe uh first time in france and um, so uh, from there, uh, I went uh, to the actual Bellow Wood Battlefield. There's not a lot there. So I had to get a little creative with making the videos. Um, you know, walked around the woods a little bit, talked about the story of Bellow Wood, talked about some of the famous people who were there. I did go to the German cemetery. Uh, it was pretty windy, so I had to get real creative with where I did my videos because the wind was blowing a lot. And it's right on a very busy road right there, the German cemetery, but I made some videos from there. Uh, I'll show you some of the pictures. Uh, so here I am. This is kind of in the center of Bellow Wood, and these are some of the, um, art the French artillery pieces that the Americans would have used. Uh, the Americans didn't have their own artillery. Uh, in France. They used French artillery, primarily 75 millimeter guns is what they were using. Um, I'm not going to be able to visit General Patton in Luxembourg, which is really unfortunate because I'm only like an hour and a half away from there right now. And I wish I could get there. Uh, welcome to everybody who's here on a stream for the very first time. It was quiet on the Western Front. French 75s. Yeah, that's pretty much what the Americans used. You think these are big? The artillery that the Germans used here in Verdun was four times that size. They were using like 420 millimeter guns, uh, just ridiculous in size. Um, I haven't had a lot of trouble with communication. Um, everywhere that I've really been so far, the folks have spoken enough English and I have spoken enough French to get by. I took three years of French in high school, but that was 25, 30 years ago. Um, yeah, I, I got to figure out the whole camera situation here. Um, so uh, yeah, this is all Bellow Wood. There's the woods there. That's actually Bellow Wood right there. Um, this is a sculpture that was um, made by Felix de Weldon, which is the same guy who made the Marine Corps Memorial, the Iwo Jima, the famous memorial uh, outside of Washington, DC in Arlington. He also made the one for the um, Angel of Marie's Heights in Fredericksburg, Virginia. His name is Felix de Weldon. Um, so that's that. Uh, there's a trench mortar, which we're, uh, you'll see more of in some of the other places that I visited. Um, not a lot of craters in Bellow Wood. Um, Bellow Wood was more of a kind of fluid back and forth battle. It wasn't a lot of trench warfare there. You'll see that in some of the later stuff. Yeah, I knew Bastogne was about an hour and a half away, but unfortunately I have a three hour drive to the Somme tomorrow. Um, so, uh, got probably eat Jones next trip is going to be the UK, maybe April or June. Um, so these are just some of the small villages that I drove through, uh, as I was making my way to the next stop, which was the Wazan American cemetery. Um, and let's see if anybody can tell me what unit this guy's a member of. We'll see how well you've been paying attention in class. By the way, American, I can observe, and I mentioned this in the chat earlier, the pop, that's what we call it in the Midwest is pop, uh, isn't as sweet here. It's probably got less sugar in it. Um, well, yeah, 93rd Division, but what is that unit? No, the 369th Infantry. 
Let's see if anybody knows what unit this guy, what was the nickname of this unit? The 300, yes. These are the Hel Harlem Hellfighters. Richard Woods was a member of the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, so uh, yeah, so I found him when I was in there and, and I used him to kind of start off my conversation uh, in my video about the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, this is the Wazan American Cemetery. This is about, uh, I think 2000 Americans buried in this cemetery. Um, Catherine Green's one of the stories I told. She was, um, she died in the flu pandemic. She was a nurse. Um, this I thought was really cool. It was in the chapel, some poppies that were left by some uh, members of the uh, Royal Air Force. You're starting your student teaching program in social studies. Any advice? Just let your passion shine through. That's the best thing I can say. I think the, the reason that um, my channel has been so successful over the last year is I think that people connect with my passion for history because they share that passion. And so it brings it out in them as well. So I, I would say just share your passion and your love uh, and respect the, the students and, and they will fall in love with history too. I'm um, not going to Nuremberg on this one. Yeah, there are a lot of, um, yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting too is you'll see a lot of Jewish stars in the German cemeteries which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so that's me. Um, there's an unknown soldier there. There aren't a whole lot of them in the Wazian Cemetery. Joyce Kilmer, um, if you were a patron, or, uh, patron, you would have seen the video that I shared at his grave. Um, he was a poet, a uh, famous poem that he wrote called Trees that was um, shared in schools a lot over the years. Um, and I shared a little bit of his story. Um, Just Jen, hey, is she in here? Hey, hey what's going on? Uh, odds, don't worry, Just Jen's a friend of mine. We uh, sat next to each other at the Sabaton concert. So how you doing, Jen? Hope you're doing well. Speaking of Sabaton, um, they're new, they got a new song coming out in a couple weeks. And uh, when I get to the site, I'll tell you about what I did. Uh, but first, so here is plot E in the Wazan American Cemetery. Uh, these are all of the men who were executed by the U.S. Army during World War II. Americans who were executed by the U.S. Army during World War II um, for murder and rape, mostly. Um, if you're familiar with the story of uh, Eddie Slovik, who was the only American executed for um, desertion in the 20th century. He was originally buried here. He was buried here until the 1980s when he was moved home to Michigan. Also buried here is the father of Emmett Till, who was a teenage boy, a black young man who was murdered by white men for flirting with a white girl. And it was one of the events that kicked off the civil rights movement in the United States. His father is buried here for rape and murder. Um, it's not a place they advertised. They don't even mention it on the map or in any brochures. And when I was talking to JD from History Underground, he told me that he had a really hard time even getting in there when he was here. Uh, they didn't want him in there and they didn't want him filming. Well, when I came, the, the gate was open and they were very permissive of people going in there. So I didn't have any trouble. There are gravestones, uh, but they're small. They look like this. Sorry, this is sideways. Let me flip this for you. They just have numbers and they're about the size of note cards. Uh, and until a few years ago, nobody knew who they were. There was a Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act request that was filed to find out who was where. So that's how why we know now who's in what grave. I appreciate that, Jen. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, moments in trading, what happened to Emmett Till was absolutely horrendous. Um, and his father's buried here and I told that story when I made the video. Today's the anniversary of Eddie Slow. You're right, it is January 31st. You are absolutely right. And I told his story in that video as well. Omar, I am in Europe until Friday. I'll be going home Friday. Yeah, it is. Plot E is hidden from the public. It's the, the men who are buried there have their backs to the other sections. They were dishonorably discharged. So um, they're not even considered to be American soldiers. I will based uh, visit Auschwitz at some point. Um, Italian Austrian front would be amazing to visit at some point. Um, I'm in Europe and we're talking about Americans. Yeah, uh, don't worry. I'm getting to the other ones. Uh, no, there are um, 
uh, there are a little over 90 of them that are buried there. The 59 just happens to be this particular number. Uh, I, I saw the Cathedral of Rims just from a distance because I didn't have time to go into it. Matt, I'm not going to be in Paris at all, unfortunately, so I won't be visiting Napoleon's tomb. Um, for some reason, I'm having a little trouble here. Let me go back to the pictures. Um, all right, let's see where we're at. Okay, um, I don't know why these are out of order a little bit, but am I planning to go to Germany? Griffin, member for nine months. Awesome. Thank you, sir. I'm definitely planning to go to Germany at some point. Uh, and Eep is going to be in a future visit for sure. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know why it, it's... For some reason, my phone was set to blast mode and it took a ton of pictures of all these places. Um, so I'll have to do it this way. So Freddy Stowers, uh, the very first black American to receive a Medal of Honor uh, for action in World War I. And he got it in 1991 from George Bush. Uh, Jen, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I will definitely pass that on to Tara. Thank you so much. You guys should check Jen's channel out. She does some great stuff. We we met because we both do Sabaton reactions, and we both were guests of Sabaton at the concert uh, in Youngstown. Uh, and we ended up sitting with each other, and she's just a sweet, very sweet person, has an amazing story. Uh, you should check out her channel. Um, so Freddie Stowers, uh, incredible heroism, um, just an amazing story, and uh, just really disgusting that it took – um, as long as it did for him to receive his Medal of Honor. Uh, I will not be going to Versailles on this particular trip. Um, Clay, thank you for being a member. Um, yeah, see, uh, Eddie Grant, Major League Baseball player, was a captain in the 307th Infantry, and he was killed by artillery leading a, a, a mission to try and get to the Lost Battalion. Uh, he was the first of three Major League Baseball players who were killed uh, in World War I. Uh, so uh, it's called Just Gen Reacts, Go Blue. Um, so that's another story. Uh, and all these ones where you see pictures of me with the grave, that's a story that I tell uh, in the video that I made from that site. Um, yeah, see, this is when I did all the, it did all the, uh, um, the bursts for some reason. So I'm going to skip all of those for the time being. Um, So let's see what else I can find you here. All right, here we go. Um, so this is pretty awesome right here. Let's start with day two. Clay, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, does Edward have any re relation to Ulysses? Not that I'm aware of. My, my first day in France was amazing. So day two, I wake up, I stayed in REM, uh, really nice hotel, really sweet, uh, very nice people there. Um, and so day two, my first stop was supposed to be the cemetery where the members of the Russian Expeditionary Force are buried. It's in the Champagne sector. Um, there are about 4,000 Russians who were killed on the Western Front. Um, Steelers and the Eagles of the NFL combined during this time. Uh, yeah, that's true. They did. Um, so this uh, cemetery here uh, is really pretty cool because it wasn't a place I was planning to stop. I'm driving through just farmland, flat farmland. It looks like Iowa. Uh, if you've ever been to Iowa in the United States or any of the, the Midwest, uh, the flat parts. And I see this cemetery and it's huge and it's out in the middle of nowhere as a lot of these cemeteries are. Uh, and yeah, it was blue skies and sunny. Yesterday's weather was fantastic. It was so different than the first day. Um, and I see a French cemetery uh, because all of the, the cemeteries, you're, it's easy to tell who they are because the American stones, uh, or the American grave markers, the German grave markers, and the French grave markers are very distinct, as are the British ones, which I haven't seen yet, but I will tomorrow. Um, and so I see this French cemetery, but I noticed that right behind it is a German cemetery. And so I had to stop. Uh, and so it was amazing. There were like 7,000 French soldiers 
four or five thousand German soldiers and a couple of hundred Polish soldiers from both World War I and World War II, all buried in what amounts to the same cemetery. Uh, Yusuf, this stream's probably going to go for a good hour and a half or two hours, I would guess. So I'll be here for a while. Um, if I had to choose one World War I battlefield to spend my entire day at, um, which cemetery would it be? Um, well, I, I haven't been to enough of them yet, but I have a feeling the Psalm is going to be uh, the one. So I don't know. Um, did I take these images on a computer? No, these were taken on my phone while I was making video. Um, so here's the German cemetery. And, the, and so here's one of those like really interesting pictures where you have a Jewish German soldier. Um, did I remember to drive on the correct side and get in the correct side of the car? Well, Marty, it's the same as it is in America, so it wasn't too hard. They drive on the right side of the road here in France. Thoughts on France so far? Um, I haven't been in Paris, so obviously I think Paris is very different than Eastern France, which is where I am. The biggest surprise to me is, you know, I always heard growing up that French people were kind of snotty and snobby and stuck up and arrogant. And that has not been in my experience at all. Uh, the phrase I keep using is that the French people I have met so far have been ridiculously friendly. Like it's over the top how nice everybody has been. I've been driving through these villages and people are waving at me and saying bonjour. And they don't just say bonjour to be polite. Like they've got a smile on their face and they're happy to see me. And uh, they've just been really, really, really nice. And it's, it's just been great. I've loved every minute of my time in France so far. Uh, the snotty ones are in the south of France. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, so, and then here there's a mass grave in the back of the German cemetery. And these are the names of some of the, the missing, um, there. And then here, uh, are some of the memories to the Polish soldiers. Um, and so here you see some of the Polish graves. Um, and like I said, there are Polish graves from both world war one and world war two in that cemetery. Um, the monuments from the Great War are looked after well. And let me tell you something that's been amazing about this, too. And this is something that I think it's it, it, it helps me understand it better. Um, but it's also something that's foreign to to me as an American. Uh, these villages and towns that are on the Western Front, I mean, they were defined by this war. Every little village of 10 or 12 houses that I drive through has this massive cemetery with thousands of graves in it right outside of town from the Great War. And it has a memorial right in the center of town that has all the names of the men from that village that died in the war. And, and so the Great War is everywhere here. Um, haven't seen a lot of World War II stuff, but that that's understandable. It wasn't as big a deal on this particular part of France as World War I was. Um, no, the Polish were fighting... Um, Oh yeah, you know, I, that's honestly that's a good question about the Polish. Um, I I think they were fighting for the French, uh, but I'll have to look that up because the way the the way it was designed and the way that it was set up and the way the wording was, it 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 definitely came across to me that they were fighting for the French. Um, when I made the videos, I did my best to try and translate what was being what was said in French in some of these. Um, so so here's another picture from, this is the Russian cemetery in Saint-Hilaire-le-Grand. Um, these are the members of the Russian Expeditionary Force who died. Uh, and so I, um, inconnu means unknown. So that's an unknown soldier. Uh, and you're going to see this phrase all over the place. Mort pour la France. Died for France. And that is not just a phrase that is used here. That phrase is significant and has meaning and even carries some legal ramifications with it. Um, so uh, to the Polish soldiers who died for the common fight. Okay. Uh, so died for France. Like it, there are villages that are labeled as Mort pour la France, like Fleury, where I went this morning. Um, if you are a individual who is designated as Mort pour la France, uh, let's say you are an author uh, you get an extension of the um, 
of the number of years that your works are copyrighted in France compared to a regular person because you more pour la France. Um, things like that. So that, I've tried to emphasize that in some of my videos, that that phrase is huge here and it means a lot. Um, most of these, almost every one of these pictures that you see, I took as a snapshot from a video. Um, Cause when I'm taking video with my phone, I use my iPhone 13 to make my videos. Um, there's a button you can press to take pictures. And so I do that at the same time. Uh, I did not go to Jim Morrison's grave cause I'm not going into Paris at all. So I didn't see Napoleon's grave actually uh, either. Um, these Russians were sent to this front to fight the Germans. Yeah. Uh, there were several thousand of them. Uh, and, and pretty much all of the ones that could be identified were buried in this particular cemetery. Uh, there were about 4,000 Russians who died on the Western Front. There were Russians who died um, in the Balkans. Um, I think there might have been some in the Italian Front as well. Um, so these are just some of those. Um, and that's the, the chapel that was made, the Russian Orthodox Chapel. It wasn't open. In fact, I couldn't even get on the grounds. The, uh, the gate was, was padlocked shut. Um, I did see the trunk carving of the French soldier in Fleury. Um, no, I, they don't have a lot of public bathrooms here. You're right. They also don't have a lot of um, gas stations here. And that was a big tip. The day before I left, my friend JD from uh, History Underground, he sent me a message to say, just, hey, be aware of the fact you're not going to see gas stations all over the place. <laughs> so I filled up yesterday morning when I left um, REMS, which was a good thing I did because um, uh, I haven't seen many gas stations since then. Uh, so here's Saint Hilaire Le Grand. Now here was here was another stop yesterday that I didn't plan on making. I was in between the drive from the Russian cemetery on my way to the location where the lost battalion got lost, and I saw this memorial and I had to stop. It's an ossuary containing the bones of ten thousand soldiers who died in the Champagne region. French and German and otherwise. Uh, I believe there are Czechoslovakian soldiers. I, I remember seeing the name Czechoslovakia on the memorial here. Um, but um, how many unplanned stops? I think those are the only two I've had so far. They were both yesterday, but it worked out yesterday because uh, yesterday was the day that I have had the best weather so far. Uh, so this was really cool. And this was my first experience with legit World War I trenches. Uh, no, the, the weather's much better here than it is in Ohio. Um, I would say the, uh, the area around Verdun in terms of the terrain reminds me a lot of central Pennsylvania with the hills and the woods. Um, I am going to go on World War II expeditions. I'm coming to Normandy later this year. Um, so these were my first World War I trenches that I experienced. And you see some barbed wire there. Um, and you can see how low in the sky the sun was. And by this point, this was my third video that I made for the day, uh, was this stop. And uh, so this was a really cool experience. Um, I don't know what those pictures are about. I must have taken some by accident. I loved this, uh, this statue at the top, the guy throwing the grenade. Um, oh, it was just really, really cool. Um, So here we are now at um, the first marker for the lost battalion. Uh, there's some question about where the lost battalion was actually lost. There are two different sites that people argue is the correct location. Um, this is also the only place so far in my three days in France where I have not had a cell phone <laughs> signal. How appropriate it was that it was in the Argonne Forest, right at the spot of the lost battalion. Most of these monuments were put up in the 20s and 30s, but some of them are newer. Drew, you're in Iceland? That's awesome. Uh, so this is one of the sites of the Lost Battalion. And there's Cher Ami on the uh, sculpture. Jen, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I heard, I heard about the snow. Right now, my home is on the edge of it that's only supposed to get one to three inches, but like an inch of ice, but it could change. And, we, and they could end up getting a foot and a half of snow. So um, thank you so much. The TV movie about the Lost Battalion is actually pretty good. Um, so, yeah, so then here's the other site. 
Now, this is the site that I actually went to. Um, and it was like a steep drop off. I can't really explain to you what the drop off was like. There's a little bit of a sense of it. Uh, that's my car and I'm about halfway down the hill at this point. Uh, I did rent a car and it wasn't that expensive. Uh, I have like a, it's a Mitsubishi Eclipse. It's an electric uh, gas hybrid Mitsubishi Eclipse automatic. And for the whole week, it was like 180 euros. Uh, so it wasn't bad at all. Uh, it was, it was, um, so this is, uh, why is it called the Lost Battalion? Uh, you'll see in the video, but basically they got surrounded by the Germans because the, the folks on either flank, the Americans and the French on their flanks fell back and they didn't. So they got surrounded and nobody knew for sure where they were and they got cut off for almost a week. And uh, it was kind of the World War I version of the 101st Airborne at Bastogne. It made all the headlines back home. They were huge heroes. And it's crazy because at the exact same time the Lost Battalion's going on, about five miles away, Alvin York is getting his Medal of Honor and nobody knows about it. Alvin York's story didn't come out for like six months after the war because everybody was talking about the Lost Battalion. Um, did I get lost at the Lost Battalion? No, but it was the only place I lost my cell phone signal. Um, so somebody put up a, a American flag down here. This water right here is where the Lost Battalion had to try and get their, uh, their water. It's actually across the creek there is where the Lost Battalion actually would have been. Um, but that gives you a little sense of it. Now, this is me coming out of the Argonne Forest and looking down over the, uh, the Meuse River Valley. Uh, and off in the distance to the left would be about the area where Hill 223 is, where uh, Alvin York got his Medal of Honor. I have not been to the Epinal Cemetery. Um, Peter, thank you. It's been a dream come true for sure. Um, so you go to Chateau Chehery, which is where I am here in this picture, uh, and everything's about Alvin York because right outside of town, about a mile outside of town, was where he got his Medal of Honor, uh, Hill 223. And so you'll see signs everywhere for and memorials and stuff related to Alvin York's story there. Uh, it's definitely a huge part of their identity. And I guarantee you every person in that little village knows who Alvin York was. Uh, it's impossible not to. This was right in the center of town, uh, a memorial to him in English and in French. Uh, th this is another site. This is one of those, um, one of those monuments that you see in every town uh, on the Western Front and probably in all of France where uh, they have the names of the people from that town. Um, oh, it was, it, Elias, it was crazy. And of course I sang a part of the song, uh, The Lost Battalion um, by Sabaton in that one. Hey, Sir Randolph, how's it going? I have not been to Deutschland yet, not on this trip, even though I'm only like an hour or two from Germany right now. Um, uh, tomorrow night, Wyatt, I, tomorrow night is the first of three nights that I'll be staying with that British couple in their bed and breakfast. That's on the Somme battlefield. Um, I believe probably each, each town probably made their own monuments, but you can usually see like on this one here, it says it was erected in 1987 by the Tennessee historical, uh, historical commission. So they usually say on the bottom who, who funded it. Um, but you see there, this is the, um, like the town hall building in uh, Chateau Chehery. Uh, it says Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité at the top. Um, so now here I am walking the trail. Uh, they call it the Alvin York Trail. There are eight stops and it's about, it's about a mile and a half walk altogether, but totally worth your time. Uh, I'm not going to Belgium on this trip, but I'm planning to come back to go to Belgium. Um, we're, that's a great question, Professor What? because World War I, I think, is the most significant event of the 20th century and one of the most significant events in all of history. Uh, there is no World War II with that. Uh, I haven't spoken to too many French locals about the war. I haven't seen many. It's, it's, it's January, so there's not a lot of people out on these sites right now. Uh, everything has gone great so far, Mr. Germany. Um, so, and I saw a bunch of people with their hunting dogs out hunting while I was here. And this was a really muddy area. So here are the signs and there are eight of them. And each one of them, each one of these stops, it tells you what happened in that spot. So here it says the road you're walking now is the exact route that Alvin York and the surviving Americans marched the prisoners to Chateau Chehery after the battle. 
near this spot is where uh, Lieutenant Max Toma, the seventh Bavarian commander, sought, or fought against the Americans. He was the last to surrender to York. And of course, all of this will be in the videos. Um, uh, so that behind me is Hill 223. That is where Alvin York got his Medal of Honor. Now, if you look at pictures of Alvin York standing there, you'll notice not a lot of trees. And that's something that is a common theme everywhere I'll go, is that I'm going to go a bunch of places where there are trees everywhere, and there weren't any in 1918, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but yeah, so this was pretty well uh, devoid of trees at the time. Uh, but that is Hill 223. And this is the sign that's actually right there. Um, and this is the view from Hill 223, looking down on the field um, the Americans would have come through. Uh, and this is looking up right uh, where you see the edge of the road right here is about where Alvin York was when he was taking out those six Germans with his pistol. Uh, is right in that spot right there. Yeah, these trees are all pretty young. Um, okay, so then we go to the largest American cemetery anywhere in Europe. This is the Meuse Argonne American Cemetery, and I'm telling you, it is the most incredible cemetery I've ever been to. Uh, it blows away anything in the United States. The way it's kept, the atmosphere, oh, it's just incredible. I mean, look at that. Uh, it, oh, I, I get chills even now looking at the pictures. I'm in France till Friday. I'd love to do a Scandinavian trip, Tornado Max. Um, but uh, yeah, this this cemetery was so incredible. I I was there about an hour and a half. Jen, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yes, I agree. Our brains do need exercise. And um, so I just uh, so this is a guy who was in the Lost Battalion. Um, so I, t I tried anywhere I saw guys that looked like they they were part of that the Lost Battalion. 307, 308th Infantry. I tried to take pictures of those, uh, and I did find quite a few of them. Uh, Victor Emmanuel Chapman, I told his story in a video. This man, this is the very first American pilot ever killed in action in the history of the United States military. First man ever shot down as a pilot. Uh, he was part of the Lafayette Escadrille. He was killed before the United States was even in the war, almost a year before the U.S. was even in the war. Yes, Germany did finally pay off the debt from the Treaty of Versailles in 2010. Um, I definitely want to come to Belgium. My wife wants to come to Belgium as well, so I will bring her for that one. Um, but Victor Emmanuel Chapman, and I saw his picture uh, today here in Verdun. One of the memorials, um, I think it was, I think it was at Duelmont they had a picture of Victor Emmanuel Chapman and mentioned him. And they mentioned that there were, there were like 60 some Americans who were killed during the battle of Verdun. Most of them part of the Lafayette Escadrille, which was the, if you've ever seen the movie Flyboys, it's a fictionalized version of the men who were in the Lafayette Escadrille. It was basically Americans who fought in the French army uh, as pilots. Uh, yeah, I'll do that reaction at some point about Jeremy Clarkson and Victoria Cross. Um, no, I don't think there were any reparations handed down to the Germans after World War II. I think we learned our lesson about that one. Um, Erwin Bleckley, if you've seen the Lost Battalion movie, uh, he was one of two um, men, men in a plane that were trying to get supplies to the Lost Battalion. And, and they had flown one mission and been shot at, and then they came back in again and went even lower. They were trying to get supplies, and they were shot down and killed. And uh, the other one, the pilot, is um, buried in the United States, but Erwin Bleckley is still uh, here in France. Vimy Ridge will not be on this trip. Uh, Vimy Ridge... Eep, uh, Mons, all those places in Belgium, that's going to be a future trip. I'm not going to make it that far north this time. Um, first impression of Europe in, on Europe in general, um, it, it's not an unexpected impression to this, um, but just observing it. Um, as an American, everything's old here, and I love that. You know, for Americans, um, 200 years is old. Um, we don't have things in our country that are much older than that. 
for the most part. Uh, here, you know, it's not uncommon for people to live in houses that are older than the United States. Uh, very common thing. Gold means Medal of Honor, yes. Yeah, Sebastian, and that gives me a lot of hope for the final versions of the videos, because typically my historic site videos don't do well, but when I saw how well those couple of clips from last night did, now I'm excited. Um, and if they do that well, uh, I'll be able to do more of these, more of these trips, so that's good. Um, yeah. Um, so Freddie Stowers, I think I already mentioned his story. Um, but uh, first black soldier to receive the Medal of Honor. There have been a few since then. Uh, and each one of the American chapels, or each one of the American cemeteries has these chapels, uh, at, usually at, at one end, that have tablets of all the missing. And I think that's pretty common to a lot of the cemeteries, not just the American ones. I took a picture of this because I thought it was cool that my Sprite was Polish. Um, and I guess that's a common thing um, you know, throughout the EU to have uh, whoever manufactures it the cheapest, you know, that kind of thing. So I thought that was really neat. I wish I could go to Colmar. I know that's southeast of here, but I won't make it there. Uh, Catherine, today was the first time I really felt that total sadness, and it was when I went to uh, Duamont Ossuary. No, it was when I went to Fleury, which was right before the Duamont Ossuary. Um, no Polish Fanta, no, I think my Fanta's French. Um, yeah, so, recycle moi. So yeah, that's French. How many countries have I been to? Um, not very many. Uh, US, Canada, Belize, Mexico, Costa Rica, Honduras, and that's it. Oh, and the Bahamas, so yeah. Uh, how's French food so far? I couldn't really tell you because I can't find a pharmacy that can issue me a vaccine pass, so I can't go into any restaurants. Um, so I've been having delivery, and, and here in Verdun, the only place it delivers is an American restaurant. So I haven't had much French food yet. Johannesburg, very cool, Francois. Um, okay, so, oh yeah, so here was my breakfast yesterday in Rims. Um, they gave you a little card, and you could fill out what you wanted and turn it in the night before. So I got some latte, some ham, bacon, some croissants, a chocolate bread, which was fantastic. Um, in a little applesauce. Okay, um, looks like some of these pictures are out of order. So let me get to um, some of the stuff from today and tell you a little bit about today. Um, I don't know why all these pictures are open. There we go. So today uh, was my first day in Verdun. And today was also my first day that wasn't... Oh, you know what? I didn't get to um, the last couple of sites from yesterday yet. Uh, so let's get to that. So Mont Falcon, which is really, really cool. Um, Wilson, yeah. Um, uh, Mont Falcon is really cool. You, uh, this is all closed off, so you can't go up into it right now, but it's, uh, it's like 200 feet high, and it's already an incredible view up there. Uh, some more German trenches, some German fortifications here. Uh, which were really cool that you could go down and get inside. Not much to see in these particular ones. Um, but, yeah, it, it was just really neat to see the German fortifications uh, in the area. Now, this these are the remains of an old church that was destroyed uh, during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive and during the fighting that took place here. Um, and what's cool about this is, and I know Indy Nidell went here on the Great War Channel. He went to this site as well. Um, they turned this particular ruin of the church into a machine gun nest. Uh, and you can see that. Jimmy, thank you. I appreciate that. Did I know when the U.S. Marines first entered the trench, we, uh, we were sniping Germans at 700 yards with standard service rifles without op optics, but the Germans thought were impossible? You talk, uh, Yeah, that doesn't surprise me a bit. And I know that um, I mentioned in my video of Bellow Wood that the Germans talked about what incredible shots the uh, the Marines were and how surprised they were by that. Um, oh, I think the Americans still would have entered the war without Lusitania. Um, so yeah, the ruins of this church were fantastic. That was really cool to see. Uh, so I got to walk around that a little bit. That's all part of Mont Falcon. 
Uh, and then I saw this. This is the town cemetery up on top of the hill at Mont Falcon. Um, I do need to get moments in trading a, a powerful flashlight, but again, can't go into any stores, so I don't know if I'll be able to do that on this trip. Um, but I thought that was really neat. Uh, I saw this church in town, which was really fantastic too. Um, so this is Valcois. Uh, Valcois was an amazing experience because Valcois was this hill that was used as an observation point and it was really important to both sides. And so there were thousands of Germans and French who died on this small hill where there had been this village. And because of the nature of the terrain underground, it was perfect for digging mines. And so there are mines everywhere and many of them still exist. And if I had been there on a day they were doing tours, I could have taken a tour. Some of them are open. I could have gone down into the mines if I wanted to. But they have signs everywhere warning you not to do that. Uh, and I wasn't going to take any chances with that. So, um, but the, the hill was just blown to bits by these mines. The largest mine the Germans blew up during the entire war was at this site. And you can see, and, and, and I don't think it comes across in the pictures. Um, I don't think it comes across in the pictures just how huge these craters are. Uh, from these mines. And that's where, if you saw my video from uh, the German trench, this is it. Um, that That's where it was, was at Valcois. And this was not even a place I was intending to go. Uh, and when I did my first preview video, like three or four weeks ago, about where I was going in France, somebody in the in the comments told me I should go there. And so I checked it out and I thought, wow, I do need to go there. And so I wouldn't have even known about it if it hadn't been for that. Um, Johnny, the German, I know a tiny bit of German and a tiny bit of French and a tiny bit of Spanish. None of them do I speak fluently, uh, unfortunately. Um, but here's the view from up there on Valcoa, and you can see why it was so important as an observation point. Uh, but basically, where I'm standing in this picture here, uh, oh, it's way more than 20 to 30 feet deep. The, the deepest ones are more like 75 or 100 feet deep. And at some point, you'll see some pictures where there are people in the picture so you can get a sense of that. Um, but where I'm standing is the German side. And where the monument is, is the French side. That's how close they were. And that was why they started digging mines, because they couldn't use heavy artillery. They were too close. They would use trench mortars. Um, but it was incredible. Uh, there you go. There's some more. So you see the people over here. These aren't the deepest ones. Uh, but you can see the people there just to give you a little perspective. There's a hole that goes right down into one of the mines. Here's one of the trench mortars here. Um, Dunkirk, not on this trip, but I will at some point. Um, so here's some more of that German uh, fortification. And there's one of the entrances to one of the galleries or mines. Um, and there's another one right there. Just an incredible sight. I would put this, I would say so far, this is right at the top of my list of my favorite places I've been in my first three days would be uh, Valcois. Just incredible. Uh, you get to see a little bit of everything. Um, Walter, I don't know. If they never adopted trench war, I think the war would have ended sooner. Um, base department against two superpowers. You got to remember, Germany was the superpower. Uh, Germany had the best army in the world in 1914. Uh, so they showed that in the early part. Of the, I couldn't enter into the galleries. Uh, you, you can only do it when, when you have a tour guide, and they only do tours like once a month. So you have to look online and see on the map or on the uh, on the calendar when those are. Uh, yeah, Germany was the superpower, especially in terms of the army. Uh, so here is on my way into Verdun, and this is the sign uh, as I was driving on the uh, the sacred road, the sacred highway. It was the one road that went into Verdun that was constantly full of trucks bringing supplies into Verdun. Is Verdun close to Ukraine or Russia? No, it's close to um, Germany, Luxembourg, Belgium. They're all within maybe two hours from here. Um so here's me coming into Verdun and you see the fortress, which I just, I cannot communicate to you how massive that fortress is. Uh, I, Cause there's nothing like this where I come from. Uh, just, 
I was just, my jaw hit the ground when I saw this thing. Oh, it's incredible. And it's got underground tunnels in it. Um, and then here's me driving. Uh, this is in Verdun on my way into my hotel. And then this is the view out my hotel window uh, of, the, uh, of the Meuse River running through. And just on the left there, you can see the cathedral, which is, it's probably a 10 minute walk from here. Um, I haven't met any Americans yet uh, out and about. I, of course, I haven't really seen a lot of people at all in any of the sites I've been. Here's Verdun at night. Uh, right there is the, that's the Verdun Memorial right there um, on the right that's lit up. Yeah, the color of the water is really, really cool. This is the Meuse River, but I believe that this this was like a canal that was dug to channel the river. So it's got like a concrete base to it and everything. Um, all right. So these are just some more pictures from yesterday, I think. Um, so let's, let me go now and try to find you some pictures from today. Um, and I want to be careful here and I want to warn you guys ahead of time about the pictures from today. Um, because they include pictures from the Duomont ossuary. So if you are squeamish or you don't want to see human remains, uh, you might want to sit the next 10 minutes or so out. Um, please don't get COVID. I'll do my best. Jimmy, thank you. You went to Europe, saw the Austrian Military Museum. You saw the uniform and the car of Franz uh, Ferdinand and Sophia. Wow, that's amazing. That would be very cool to check out. I am still in France. I'm in Verdun. I'm going to the Somme tomorrow night. Um, okay, so this is Fleury. This is one of the, uh, that's Fleury, this is not. Uh, this here is a memorial that was made, uh, was paid for by a wealthy American, which is why you say, you see here that it was um, from your American brothers. Um, Tim, yeah, I can do that. Um, so this is what's known as the Trench of the Bayonets. Uh, it's one of those stories that kind of took on mythology status uh, and has some truth, but also some embellishments to it. Uh, I won't get too much into the story because I'm good. I did a video on it, but you'll notice there's no bayonets, um, but there are French soldiers buried here. Uh, and it was um, it was a story that was told that basically that the men with bayonets fixed had been buried alive by artillery and were left where they died standing up. It didn't happen that way, but it is a grave. Uh, the Germans just used the guns uh, to mark the graves. Uh, that's why they were sticking up out of the ground. Should be a classy change from my American roots. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, moments in trading, 57,000 casualties at the Somme on the first day. 19,000 of them were killed. Sometimes it gets tricky because you hear casualty numbers. Um, that doesn't mean killed. 19,000 killed uh, by the, for the British side. Um, the Somme, that was the bloodiest day in British history. Verdun, I think the dead on both sides is something like 300,000 um, altogether. So a soldier of France, uh, unknown soldier of France. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is Fleury. This was the first place I really felt the sadness in a significant way. Um, and Indy Nidell did a video on the Great War Channel about this. And he was the one who told me when I talked to him um, about it and asked him, I said, you know, where would you recommend going? Fleury was the top of his list. It was the first place he mentioned to me that I should definitely check out. Um, Fleury was a village. It's one of, I think, eight villages that are labeled as Mort pour la France, died for France. They have a mayor. Uh, they are still officially a village, though there's nobody that lives there. Nobody can live there. Uh, it's part of that red zone where, uh, you know, there's ammunition and explosives and bodies and all of that. And just nobody can live there. Um, I'm going to Fort Vaux tomorrow as well as going back to Fort Duomont because it wasn't open. It'll be open tomorrow, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, Fleury was, was pretty intense. Here's that carved soldier that was carved out of a tree. Uh, and there's a story with that because on that spot is where they found a couple of dozen um, dead soldiers who had been laid out in a basement. 
to be, eventually be buried. And then the, the building was exploded and it collapsed and they never buried the bodies. And so they were buried right where they had been laid out in the basement. Uh, I have played Verdun Spade Gaming. Uh, so Fleury, it was pretty intense. Uh, this was really cool. This was a sign. And I know some of you speak German and English, or German and French, but if I understand it right, basically what we're seeing here is that a German village in Bavaria and Fleury in France jointly planted this tree. I don't know if I got a picture of the tree, but I got it on video. Um, the German village was destroyed during the Napoleonic Wars by the French army, and Fleury was destroyed as a result of the German attacks in the Great War. And so it was a, a kind of this coming together of two villages that had been destroyed by one another's armies as a way of planting a tree in solidarity. solidarity. Uh, so I think that's basically what that says, if I understand my German and French well enough. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, I didn't feel real claustrophobic, but I imagine if I was in there with a bunch of other men and it was muddy and there were rats and there were explosions going on all over me, it would be a different story. Yes, Jimmy, that's one of my all-time favorite quotes uh, from any time in history. Um, it wasn't Pershing, though. It was an American colonel who was giving a speech. It's often attributed to Pershing. Uh, but it was an American colonel who was giving a speech at Lafayette's grave. They had this ceremony when the Americans first arrived. And he was the one who said, Lafayette, we are here. Together, they planted the tree of the people. Okay, yeah. Okay, I, I thought I basically understood that's what it was saying there. Um, the, Drew, the French people have been, I keep using the same phrase, ridiculously kind uh so incredibly kind everybody's been so friendly uh just I, i've honestly been blown away uh, now granted i'm not in paris i'm not in a big city i'm out in the countryside but oh they've been wonderful absolutely wonderful um okay so there's a little more of fleury there's where the school was this was really sad when i saw this uh to the children who died for france uh, and then it has the names of some of those kids. Uh, so, and that's the largest monument in Fleury. There aren't very many monuments in Fleury, but that was the largest one. Did I storm any trenches? No. Um, that's not like French people, Charlie Mills says. Well, Oz, I, can, I can tell you, I, that's what I had always heard about French people was rude, stuck up. That has not at all been my experience at all with French people. Um, I haven't spoken to too many. The, the folks that work in hotels and things like that, they all know English. Um, and I know just enough. I, I, I spoke briefly to a, um, a French guard that was working at the American, the Wazan American Cemetery. Um, and he didn't speak very much English. I could tell he didn't understand a lot of what I was saying. So I tried to say a few things to him in French. But I basically told him, je ne parle pas français, <laughs> uh, that I, I don't speak a lot of French. So um, I'll tell you what's really cool about Verdun so far. Pretty much all the major places I've been in Verdun go out of their way to honor the German soldiers, too. I was surprised by that. Considering what the German army did to France... Um, what they, the, the number of deaths that were caused because of a war that in French minds was started by the Germans, that was impressive to me. Um, a lot of that. I, see, I saw that at Fort Douaumont. Uh, I saw that at Fleury. Uh, it, it was pretty fascinating to see it that way. Uh, Joe, that's okay, man. I'm just glad you're here. Yeah, don't, don't ever feel bad for not being able to support me on Patreon. Just watch videos, hit that like button, and I'm grateful for that. Um, the areas in the red zone, uh, the areas that they don't want you to go are usually marked. They usually try to keep you, get you to keep to the paths. All the areas I've been to so far are pretty well traveled by tourists, so I don't think there's a lot of issue in any of those areas. Um, let's see. So that's all Fleury still. Took a lot of pictures at Fleury. Um, all right, so here's just a sign right as I'm... All, a lot of the Verdun sites are kind of like in all in one little area of the battlefield. So Verdun, Fort Vaux, Fleury, 
uh, Duamont Ossuary, uh, the trench of the bayonets, those are all within like a mile or two of each other. They're all super really close. Um, now I think, uh, I think this sign actually does mean children. Um, because, uh, maybe somebody can read the bottom, uh, because it's, I don't know, it seems to me that, um, especially since there's a, a girl's name on there, um, I've never, I've not seen it written that way anywhere else. Usually it's written sons of France, um, when it's talking about soldiers, I, I think these are civilians. Verdun is World War One. Um, So yeah, I mean, I, that's definitely talking about children, rather than children of France, like like people who are like French. Um, so yeah, this is a sign just warning you: don't play music, don't camp out here, don't eat here, don't play soccer here, football here. Um, so this was really cool. Now, when you go to the Duomont Ossuarian Cemetery, on one end of the cemetery is this monument uh, to the Jewish soldiers who fought. And on the opposite end is a monument to the Muslim soldiers who fought. Uh, and those are the only two monuments other than kind of the main one that you really see there. Um, uh, yeah, Quentin and Theodore Roosevelt are buried in Normandy. Uh, so I won't be getting to that, to those graves. Um, all right, so here's the Duamont Ossuary. In this building are the bones of 130,000 soldiers, uh, Germans, French, probably others as well. Um, I'm not going to be going into Paris, no. I just don't have time, unfortunately. Um, so then this is a view down toward the cemetery from the ossuary. Um, there are some grave mar markers with Islamic symbols. I'll see if I can find, uh, I've seen a few of them. I don't know if I saw any today, but I did see some yesterday. Uh, you'll see them in the videos for sure. Okay. So, um, Epe is just too far North. Yeah. Uh, you're in, um, with the limited amount of time I had, um, I just couldn't get to everything and it would have been so, so much further to go up there, uh, that I wouldn't have had time to do that and then come back around to get to, um, back to the Paris airport. Uh, so I'm planning a future trip to come to Belgium. Um, all right, so here we go. Uh, going around the back, that, that building, as I said, has, has the bones of 130,000 soldiers, uh, in it. Uh, and you can see them. There are these little windows, and I'll um, I'll be honest with you. It was one of those things I knew I had to do, but I wasn't sure in that moment if I wanted to do it. Uh, I walked up to it, um, and, and I hesitated. Torsk, what's going on, man? Good to see you. Um, my vaccines are up to date. I couldn't have got into the country if my vaccines weren't up to date. Um, it's just that I don't have the vaccine pass. I could get one if I was in Paris because they have places I can get one in Paris. They just don't have any where I, where I am now. I think the nearest pharmacy I can get a vaccine pass is like a hundred miles away. Um, but yeah, you have to, you have to be fully vaccinated to enter the country, um, and pass a COVID test. Uh, but so I, 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 I don't have to wear a mask outside. No, um, only indoors. Okay, so here's the, um, I'm not going to be in Saint Mihail. That's too far south from where I'm going to be. Um, so here you go. Um, this is looking inside of the windows. You could be like five feet away from the windows and you really can't see inside. You have to really get up close to them and they're small. They're like a foot by a foot, each one of them. Um, but I, I'll tell you, it was quite a thing. This is the first time... I've ever been face to face with actual human remains. Um, so it, it was pretty overwhelming uh, to see, uh, especially that one right there. 
Uh, and this will all be in the video. And I did kind of a disclaimer in that video. I imagine that video is going to get demonetized because of this, but I feel like it needed to be shown. Uh, they are real. These are the bodies of men who died in Verdun. German, French, all mixed together. 300,000 people died in Verdun. Uh, 16,000 are in the cemetery there at Verdun. 130,000 are in these rooms full of bones uh, in, the, in the ossuary. Uh, and then I think something like 60,000 bodies have never been recovered, are still on the battlefield somewhere. Um, yeah, this was, this was sobering. And, and you literally just saw pictures from three of like 40 of the windows that you can look into. So there's the Muslim monument there. I do know about UNESCO. They have the World Heritage Sites, yes. Um, yes, I am, I am in Verdun. Um, I don't know why they chose to do it that way, Charlie, but I think it's a powerful um, message about war, I, I think. I think it's, it's unlike anything I've ever experienced on a battlefield to actually see the human cost of this battle. Uh, it, it was incredible. It really was. Not going to Holland on this trip. Uh, this was a really cool statue that was right on the edge of the Duamont Cemetery, uh, showing a French soldier laying down. The Muslims were probably Algerians. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain that's probably where they were from. That's a picture of my steering wheel, apparently. Uh, so these are some trenches. Verdun was surrounded by 19 uh, forts and strong fortifications, and then they were all connected with trenches. And so this is uh, one of the trench lines that's running between Duelmont, uh, the cemetery, uh, going up uh, the hill uh, up the road to where Fort Duelmont is. And, and they've reconstructed part of it. Uh, they've actually put the, the planking on the sides so you can see it. And I got some video of that too. This is one of the smaller ruins of one of the, the strong points that you can see. These are a couple of graves that were just kind of on the side of the road that just say unknown heroes. Uh, there's some more uh, fortifications. This is at Fort Duamont. Um, and I think, I think that's where I took that. Um, I have just a couple of pictures from that. No, I guess I didn't really take any. Um, so that's really about it as far as the pictures go. This is in front of my hotel. It's absolutely gorgeous here. It really is. It's, it's such a cool little town. And it doesn't have, I mean, Verdun has like a population of like 15 or 20,000 people. It's not a very large city. Um, I, I think there are some World War II monuments here and there around here. Moroccans, okay. Um, but um, tomorrow... I'm going back to Fort Duelmont. I was there briefly, but the weather was really horrible. It was super windy, so I, I couldn't really make any narration videos outside. So I shot a couple of quick clips. Plus, um, it was closed, and the sign said that it opens on February 1st. So I'm going to go back tomorrow. Um, I'm going to have a couple hours in the morning. I'm going to go to Fort Duelmont. I'm going to go to Fort Vaux. Uh, and then I'm going to head up to the site where the very last soldier to die on the Western Front was killed. Uh, Henry Gunther, he was an American who was killed at 1059, one minute before the armistice. It's, uh, it's like 10 or 12 miles north of Verdun. Uh, and I'm going to go there. And then from there, I'm headed to the Somme. I've got like a three and a half hour drive uh, to get to the Somme. So that's what I'll be doing in the afternoon tomorrow. Um, it does, it, Pascal is strange. Uh, it, it's definitely unique. Um, but it's also very kind of exciting to be in a place that I've dreamed of going for so long. I'm going to show you guys just a couple of videos real quick. How's that go? Uh, why don't we do that? I'll give you a little preview of a few of the video clips that I shot. Um, I've also been sharing some of these. Um, I'm going to upload a couple more tonight for our patrons and our members as well. Um, let me see what I can find for you that would be interesting. All right, here's one. Um, you may, if you saw, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw this one. 
And I don't know if I've got the sound turned up enough, so let me let me turn the sound up so you can hear this. Um, I had to do this, so this is for the Sabaton fans. Oh, I've been walking for about a mile, but I feel like I have to do it. In the draft of 1917, a man from Tennessee. Overseas to the trenches, he went to the land of the free. Into war, he brought two things along, a rifle and his face. Joined the ranks as a private and assigned to 328. There, on the day, out in the York, into the fray, saving the day. All the way. Uh, let me find the other one because um, I think I did one where I actually pointed to different key this time singing. Into the fires of hell they are gone, a hero to be. Into the war from over the sea, into be 1918, all the way from Tennessee, till 223. Can't believe I'm standing here right now. This is amazing. So that that was pretty exciting, and it was hard to get to. Um, yeah, sorry, I turned down the volume on my speakers uh, so that it wouldn't give you feedback and echo twice. Um, but here, I'll show you a little bit. Uh, see if I can find. A... This is up on Hill 223 on the German position. So this is where the Germans would have been up here. Um, let's see when I find another one. So this is the actual spot. This is machine gun nest list. Right above that road is where the machine gun nest was. Down the hill. Now the York came from over there. And so right, right down here uh, is where Alvin York was when he was picking off the Germans with his pistol and with his rifle. Uh, so you can see the view the Germans had down the hill at where Alvin York was when this happened. I had good weather, Andre, yesterday. It wasn't so great today. Yeah, I had been hiking for like a mile at that point uh, on the hills. So I was, I, if I could bring a metal detector, I would, but I, there's no way I'd get it into the country. There weren't, Ryan, there probably weren't any trees on this hill at all at that point. Um, they've grown back since then. Let's see. I'll show you a little bit of the um, the site in Champaign. This is that, um, this is that ossuary. It's got, there's 10,000 dead inside there, and it was closed, so I couldn't go inside. I'm in Europe. What is a mile? Spooky boy, I hope work goes well. Uh, yeah, at some point we will definitely talk about the Indian soldiers who died uh, in the war. Um, let me see if I can find, let me go to day three. Let me find you some video from today at one of the sites. So you'll see how windy it is. This is one little shot from Fort Duamont. But as I got up on top, it got really super windy. Um, this is also Fort Duamont. This is walking in. I went to, uh, BJ, I went to Bellow Wood my first day here. Uh, I, I did a video on the Harlem Hellfighters. Yeah, that'll be um, going up when I start uploading the videos. Um, let's see what else I got here. If there's anything good I can show you. And then I'll talk, kind of talk through a little bit of what I'm doing the last few days. So this is just gives you a sense of what Verdun, the area around Verdun is like. It's these big, massive hills and trees all over. 
there were very few tourists. I think when I was at Duelmont, there might have been two other people there. When I was at, um, yeah, I don't think I've been anywhere there was more than two or three people so far uh, at any of the sites I've been to. Um, so anyway, uh, so tomorrow, yeah, it was really windy today. Um, the first videos will go up next week. Um, maybe Sunday if I have time to edit. Uh, if not, then certainly by Wednesday. And the plan is every Wednesday and Sunday, um, I will be uploading videos from the trip. Uh, I can tell you what videos I have so far. So, um, cause I'm sorting the videos in folders. So, um, day one, I've got enough stuff to make five videos from day one. Uh, I won't necessarily do them in this order though. Day two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven videos from day two. And day three, I think from today, there's only three videos. Today was my first day to relax a little bit. I slept in. I didn't wake up till about 10. I'm still adjusting to the time difference. Um, this is the first day I haven't had a nap. I've been up all day this time. So I'm almost adjusted now to the time difference. Um, tomorrow, I'll probably make four more videos. Uh, and then at the Psalm, between the two days, probably eight or 10 more videos. So. Um, I should easily end up with over 30 videos from the trip. Um, but um, so tomorrow, um, Fort Vaux, Fort Duelmont, uh, the story of Hen Henry Gunther, who was the last soldier killed on the Western Front. Uh, I might make one or two more, and then I'm going to be driving most of the afternoon to get to the Somme. Next two days will be the Somme battlefield. A lot to do there. Um, that'll be mostly focused on the British because they're really the only ones I haven't talked about yet in any of my videos. It's mostly been about the French, the Germans, the Russians, the Americans, uh, and a few others who fought in these areas. Um, I will not have any guides, but, um, if they're open, there should be people there, but I I've done my research. I have a pretty good understanding of both places. Uh, oh, the Georgia for folder. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it's, um, typed like that but those are all my video clips from when I went to Georgia. Um, I will have some French food. Don't worry. I will find a way to have some French food. Um, I'm staying in a bed and breakfast with this British couple though. So they'll probably be making my, my dinners. Um, Johnny, I would love to take a selfie with you when I come, if I come to München or Augsburg. Um, I haven't met really much of anybody so far. Hey, JD, what's going on, man? Um, and it's funny that JD pops into the chat right as I open the Georgia folder because look, there he is right there in the flesh. JD threatened to unfriend me on Facebook because he was jealous of all my posts. Uh, but it's only because of my jealousy of his trips uh, to France that kind of kicked me into gear to do this in the first place. Jimmy, thank you so much. And I have to say, first of all, thank you for the support, but thank you for your, for your service, Marine. Uh, I'm sure you're probably looking forward to Bellow Wood. Um, it was pretty cool being in Bellow Wood. My cousin, uh, Brent Jr., was a Marine. He was a mortarman in the Marine Corps. Uh, and so he was pretty excited for me to go to Bellow Wood. Um, when you went through basic, basic training, you had to perform night raids and defenses out without night vision goggles with simulated mortar fire and explosion and casualties evacs. Thank God there was no razor wire. Yeah, amen to that. But again, thank you for your service, Jimmy. Really appreciate it. Um, I really hope that I can hit that many views. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, when JD figures out when I can tell you guys about a trip to, uh, Normandy at some point, although JD has been there multiple times, so he's probably not in any big hurry, but you guys definitely check out JD's stuff. He's got some amazing stuff from Normandy right now. So I'm not the only one doing videos in France right now. Um, I'm just the only one that's still here. He was just here a few months ago. I'm just catching up on the chat a little bit here, guys. Um, am I going to Belgium? Yes. My wife wants to come with me when we go to Belgium. we got to get her a passport first. Um, but uh, she she wants to come to Belgium. We actually, um, if things had worked out differently with COVID and everything, uh, we wanted to come to Belgium in December and do like the Christmas markets and stuff. But we want to wait until things are a little more stable, I guess you would say. Um, but yeah, Belgium's definitely going to be in the works. I want to go to Waterloo. I want to go to Bastogne. Um, I, I want to go to Mons. I want to go to Ypres. 
uh, places like that for sure. Yeah, I'm here till uh, here till Friday. I'll be going home on Friday. I am near the Belgian border. I'm an hour and a half from Bastogne right now. Uh, Aachen isn't too far away from me either, Paul. And if I had more time, I would have gone to Aachen while I was here. I have played Battlefield 1. Um, I haven't really run into anybody out and about, Mr. Tambourine Man, that I didn't hear speaking French. Liège would be another place I would love to go. Um, Just catching up on things here a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I figured that's kind of why we didn't go the Black Soldier. We were afraid that that might happen, that we'd book our travel and everything, and then the Belgian Christmas markets would close down. So um, lots of countries on the list to visit that I want to go to for sure. Uh, next on the list is the UK, though. Uh, depending on my wife and children's schedules, it's either going to happen around Easter. If not Easter, probably the first week of June. Um, not going to Germany on this trip, but I definitely want to go to Germany. My nine-year-old has been working on his German. He's going to be our translator when we go. Um, I'm, I'm going to, speaking of the Franco-Prussian War, I'm going to be driving through Sedan tomorrow on my way to the Somme. I don't know if there's anything there associated with the, with Sedan. I didn't do any research on anything that wasn't World War I related, um, but I know Sedan was a big part of the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, the UK, wow. Uh, first trip will be with the family, so it's not going to be a lot of history-related stuff. Um, London, we're going to go to Glasgow and Edinburgh and Scotland. We're going to go to Manchester, um, probably Birmingham, just because a lot of my family's from there. Um, Torsk, yeah, <laughs> so you don't need to do touristy things with your family. Um, nice. So those, yeah, so there's, those are some of the places. Yeah, Metz isn't real far from where I am either. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, guys. Thank you so much for joining me for this chat. Thank you to everybody who donated. Thank you for sharing in my excitement. Uh, and I cannot wait to bring you more of it. Um, probably not tomorrow night since I'm not doing a lot. But the next night, if my internet connection is good, um, I will be doing another live stream uh, to share with you my experiences from my two days at the song. Uh, by that point, I'll be pretty much done with my trip except for going back to the airport. So that'll be Thursday night. Um, no, that'd be, wait, tomorrow night's Tuesday. Wednesday's my first day at the song. Thursday's my second day. So I'll probably do a stream Wednesday and one Thursday as well. Um, so I'll be back for that, uh, share some more with you. Definitely gonna do a Jack the Ripper tour in London. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm here by myself, yeah. Uh, I'll share some more videos for the patrons, maybe put a couple more. Um, I'll put another one up live for everybody tonight. Um, just got to pick one. So thank you, guys. We'll see you again real soon.